The 36th Ulster Division uh, was one of the units in Kitchener's army. Lord Kitchener, the minister responsible for recruiting a new army to take on the Germans, was keen to use Irish soldiers because there'd been a long tradition of Irish soldiering. But the 36th came from a very particular kind of Ireland. It came from Ulster and it was made up largely though not entirely of Ulster Unionists. Uh, most of them would have signed the famous pledge known as the Ulster Covenant on 28th of September 1912 and they would have drilled in what was a paramilitary organisation. Uh, it armed itself with guns smuggled in from Europe and it was absolutely dedicated uh, to resisting devolution to a Dublin Parliament, Home Rule as it was called. So when the war came, uh, Kitchener is very keen to get these men on board. A lot of negotiation is required, but eventually Sir Edward Carson, leader of the Unionists, seals the deal and in early September this new division of Kitchener's army is formed. It's about 17,000 strong. Uh, that includes infantrymen, mainly from the three northern recruiting regiments in Ireland, the Royal Irish Fusiliers, Royal Enniskilling Fusiliers, a very famous regiment, and the Royal Irish Rifles, which recruited in the northeast of Ulster, and that uh, was dominated by men who came from Belfast. Well, the first thing, of course, is uh, like any new division of men, they had to train, and they began that in Ireland for several months. Then they went over to England, did a bit of training in what was called musketry the ability to handle and fire and target a weapon, which many of them would have had precious little real experience of. So in October of 1915, they are shipped over to France. Now, that first winter that they are in the trenches, so to speak, it's not the most severe or testing time that they would experience. They were getting used to trench warfare, they'd have had 10 days in the front line and the rest of the month would have been either in reserve or behind the lines. But nonetheless, they begin to get a picture of what trench warfare is like. No man's land and the, on the other side of the, the mysterious German enemy, um, they begin to get used to some of the aspects of some of the dangers that are there. Nonetheless, they do have to do gas training uh, in case they get uh, poison gas sent across to them uh, and they have to get used to rather meagre food they have to get used to sleeping sometimes in the open in very damp and grim conditions so uh, the winter of 1915 to 16 is all about getting used to the trenches during that whole time they keep in touch with home in those days a letter could get from britain to the trenches in two days and um, so there is a constant interaction and because many of the men were from loyalist unionist backgrounds, they had been, for example, in the Orange Lodges. In fact, they formed new Orange Lodges when they were in the army. Um, back home in the circles that would have moved in and out of Protestant halls, Orange halls, Protestant churches, there would have been a very, very strong identification with these men. And they were known as Carson's Army. The thing then is, of course, that by the early months of 1916, they have been moved to a new position. And that position is a fascinating one because it's on the Western Front in the Somme sector where the big plan is, and Haig, the, the Field Marshal Haig is of course in charge of this plan, the big plan is to try to break through the static warfare that has bedeviled the Western Front. The 36th Division are given a task which is to take possibly the strongest fortified location on that sector, known as the Schwaben Redoubt, built by Schwabian soldiers a little time before, and a redoubt, of course, is a fort. Uh, so their task, astride a tributary of the River Somme, called the, called the River Ancre, is to go across when zero hour comes, when the campaign commences, and take those objectives. <laughs> 